question. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Camilla, for uh, being our speaker today. And her topic is theater techniques for narrative uh, XR. So welcome, um, Camilla. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, before I dive in, I'll just talk a little bit about my background and how I came into this, which is that I am an opera and theater composer. I write music for theater and for opera. And um, so that that's sort of what led me to being interested in XR in the first place, which is looking for new ways to push these very old art forms forward and make them resonate with a modern audience. But in working in XR and in integrating XR into theater and opera, um, it's become very, very clear that theater also has something to offer to the XR industry. And so that's that's really what this presentation is about, is um, how people working in XR can look to these techniques that have been developed in theater to make their narrative pieces and even pieces that are gaming pieces feel realistic and um, to really drive the audience experience because that's really what we do in theater. Um, so first I want to talk about the difference between film technique and theater technique, which is specifically that film technique has developed as a way to guide where the audience is looking. And so that's in terms of camera angle, camera placement, um, how close up or far away the shot is, but also in terms of editing. Other than that, in film, uh, particularly now, we rely a lot on quick cuts to really point where the audience, the viewer, is supposed to be looking at any given point in time. But of course, when we translate into an XR experience, particularly in the virtual reality environment, um, you can't decide where the audience is looking. The, the whole point of an immersive experience is that the audience should be able to choose for themselves. But we still want to be able to drive the storyline forward in a way that makes sense, uh, particularly with narrative XR. And so what that relies it on is different techniques for guiding where the audience looks where you suggest to them where they should look, even though you can't actually control where they're looking at any, any given point in time. And that's a technique that theater has really evolved uh, in the hundreds, thousands of years of its existence, right? Dating back to Greek theater and all the way up into the present when we have expanded beyond the proscenium stage into uh, 360 theater, immersive theater. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a few of these techniques, which are all, again, all about asking and guiding audiences to where they should be looking in order to move the narrative forward in a compelling way. Um, the three that I'm going to focus on right now are lighting, sound, and specific performance practices among the actors. But of course, once you start looking at theater technique, you could even get into the, the minutia of uh, set design, mise-en-scene on theater is um, slightly different than it is in film, uh, costume design and there are many many aspects that you could look at but, but this is a good place to start so um, I'm going to begin talking about lighting then sound and performance practice I'm going to close by showing a couple of case studies of my own collaborations uh, that involved uh, theater practitioners coming together with XR practitioners and then um, we can open it up for questions if anyone has questions so first we'll start with lighting because I think that this is the most uh, visually oriented, of course, but and so in many ways the most obvious place to start. Um, and lighting performance, uh, just a little bit of theater history. Uh, lighting in theater uh, has really, really changed um, from the, the Greek theater, which uh, if, if you're familiar with theater history, Greek theater is all outdoors, and so natural lighting uh, changed the mood of the piece, which is why um, as the sun set over the end of the piece, that in itself is a dramatic change. Um, but theater lighting really comes into its own with the introduction of first uh, candles that are colored by colored glass, and then gaslight, which uh, allows more control over the dimming and brightening of the lights than candles do, of course. Um, 
the problem was like that gas lights although they were more controllable than candles they're not totally controllable and so they tended to set places on fire um, and so contemporary lighting really starts with the invention of the limelight which uh, doesn't have this this problem that the gas lighting does and comes into its own with electric lighting which is which is what's led to contemporary lighting theory um, and this is in uh, London and then employed ex and extensively throughout opera, which has often been an early adopter of technology. Um, contemporary lighting systems include dimmers, which allow you to control the intensity of the light, which as we're going to see in a second is very important. So how do we use light to control or guide the audience experience? Um, a lot of contemporary lighting practice in theater comes from a book called The Standard System by Stanley McCandless, and so this is also known as the McCandless system. And it's really a guide for how do you separate the actor from their background. Um, and so this is something that as you're building your environment for your XR experience, you can put into practice because Unity, um, and this is the platform that I'm more familiar with, I'm sure that this exists in Unreal also, um, Unity does have these really specific controls for lighting within it. Um, spotlight versus area light, for example, you can put color in both of these uh, lighting implements. and so. As you're designing the space, you can actually borrow from these uh, theatrical methods in order to create the emotional content of the environment, but also in order to guide where the audience is looking. So how does the McCandless system work? Basically, uh, McCandless suggests that you need at least two lights pointed at an actor to separate them from the background. Um, these are placed at 45 degree angles to the actor and that this creates uh, sufficient enough lighting to, to make them pop out uh, when compared to the general lighting of the set. Um, other things to think about is where are you placing the lights in re relationship to where the actor is, right? Uh, front light is light, is just what it sounds like, light that is shining from the front. And this is going to create a different set of shadows and a different kind of emotional feel than if you put the light at the side shining from the frame above on them. Um, and that also creates a different feel from if you put the light uh, on the floor shining up a foot light so uh, lighting really does create this sort of uh, psychological uh, landscape for your characters to walk around in um, through this use uh, even just the placement of the light is going to really determine how the character is separated from the scenery and how we're supposed to feel about the character right if I have a character who's completely brightly lit with front light that already tells me that I should have a more positive feeling about that character than if they're lit from underneath with a footlight footlights are sort of ex accentuate uh, the shadows under the eyes and under the cheeks and make people look a little scarier than they are necessarily so um, choosing the direction of the light is really, really important for, for giving us this first sort of emotional response to our characters. Um, another thing that you can control is the cut of the light, which is how sharp the edge is. And again, this is something that you can use uh, the spotlight versus the aerial light for. The spotlight feature is has a much sharper edge than the area feature. So if we really want somebody to pop out and we really want to define a space, we use spotlight. Whereas if we want it to be a little fuzzier, we would use the area light. Um, and so this is how this is a large. Uh, portion of how lighting really guides where we are supposed to be looking, which is the difference between the special light, the one that is focused on that character, versus the general ambient lighting in the background or the wash, right? So I can be what, what stage lighting designers do is they may choose one sort of color or mood for the background and an entirely different color for that character. So this is going to depend, of course, on what kind of uh, play or narrative I'm dealing with. Um, 
if I have something that's sort of a mystery, um, maybe I want to choose a very blue color for the background and then some kind of a, a warmer color for my characters to really make them pop out. Um, We'll see in a second how color can really be used to create the um, emotional landscape of the piece. Um, I may decide that I want my character to blend into the background more, and so I would choose to use the same colors, uh, the same kinds of lights. Um, the other thing that I can vary, of course, is the intensity of the light, how bright it is. Do I want it to be dim, or do I want the person to really pop out? And this is all about putting focus, right? So if I am in my environment and I see a bright spot out of the corner of my eye, then my tendency is going to be to turn towards whatever is in that bright spot. Same if I see a contrasting color. Basically, contrasts will pull the eye towards them. Um, so let's, let's talk about color. Uh, color is really the most important component of a lighting design because the color choice can really affect the mood of the scene. Um, basically, we can think about the difference between warm colors versus cool colors versus neutral. Um, and each of these is created through the way that light